Good morning, FBC. So glad to see all of you today. I don't know about you, but whenever I see that timer counting down, and I'm just, all right, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, and it's still just time. It's ticking and ticking. It's almost like I'm, I'm watching the microwave for a frozen burrito to finish up. And, thanks. But hopefully, unlike a frozen burrito, there won't be a cold spot in the middle when we actually get to worship. So if you would, please, let's stand and worship together. I can sing forever of your love, come down With my hands to heaven, shout your praises now I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love, come down oh, 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 oh. See, I'm so excited to keep you sing in our place
faithful, keeping those promises to us. Speaking of promises, we're going to have some babies we get to look at for a bit. Have a seat, everybody. Moms and dads and babies, would you come here to the front and just line up over here next to me. Church family, we have the joy of dedicating these parents and blessing these children with the meanings of their names that will become prophetic, I believe, in their future. Uh, you notice we're kind of doing it out of cycle. You know, normally we do this on Mother's Day and on Thanksgiving, but we're getting to where we're having so many babies around here that I didn't like the assembly line. <laughs> So we decided we're going to do it a little more often so that we can really focus in upon these beautiful children that the Lord is bringing into our congregation. You know, moms and dads, it's, it's a, a great blessing. The Lord says that children are a blessing, a heritage from the Lord. Now, I know it says they're a blessing, but they feel like a burden, don't they? <laughs> Sometimes they're just overwhelming. And in the years ahead, you're going to have even greater burdens as you're dealing with these precious children and raising them up. But I want to tell you, God has a reward for you. If you won't kill them, <laughs> he will give you grandchildren. And then you will be able to take revenge upon your children and spoil them rotten. You know, I'm, I'm doing it with mine. I got two wonderful little grandsons, and last week, or actually two weeks ago, my oldest grandson was kicked out of Sunday school. You say, well, he got kicked out of Sunday school. Yeah, because his, his papa taught him to say, one of these days, one of these days, pow, right in the kisser. And when his nursery worker tried to get him to do something he didn't want to do, he said, one of these days. <laughs> revenge it's so sweet <laughs> so sweet <laughs> moms and dads you know what you're doing today you're dedicating yourself you're making a vow before the lord and the scripture says don't make a vow lightly make sure you understand what you're doing as you make a vow better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it okay and so the vow that you're making before the lord is that you will raise these children in an environment that will be conducive for them to come to know Jesus at an early age. And you'll raise them under the precepts, the commandments of the Lord, and in hopes that you will provide all the kindling that's needed for the Holy Spirit to one day ignite that. Ignite them unto salvation and then unto true discipleship. Believing that you understand the importance of this, I ask you, do you make this vow before the Lord? today. Amen. May I pray over you? Father, thank you so much for these precious children. Thank you for these parents who are dedicating themselves to raise their children in the church, in the Word, in the Spirit. Lord, I pray that you will help them, and I know that you will. Lord, I pray that their marriages will be strong, so that, Lord, they might demonstrate the love that you have for the church and that you have for them. Lord, may your rich blessings be upon them. May your protection be upon them. Lord, we know that the evil one has plans. But, Lord, no plan formed against us will prosper. For, Lord, you are greater, far greater than any opposition these families will ever face. Help them to rest in you, to trust in you. And, Lord, to live their life under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, as I pronounce these blessings upon them, upon their names, Lord, we pray that this might in some way be prophetic, that, it, Lord, they might indeed become what they have been named. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor, I do want to say something. They are no longer attending. His grandson lives out of state. We would not have kicked him out. We redirect. We redirect. <laughs> so we would have just kept loving him and redirected his behavior. So we miss his grandson. So I got kicked out all the time. You know, I spent most of my time in the hallway of the church, with, hoping my daddy, the deacon, wasn't going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> he learned from his grandfather too. <laughs> this morning we have the Barton family. We have Jeremiah, Hugh, Barton. And parents are Marlon and Boston, um, Arden, excuse me, Arden. Isn't this a beautiful family? We're so grateful God has yes. brought them to us. 
I'm going to come over here, Jeremiah. Jeremiah Hugh, your names combine to me one who is exalted by God and exalts God with great wisdom and great intelligence. May that become reality. And God's people said, Amen. Your daddy. You take that as well. Let's take a picture together. He's going to get one more. There we go. Step right over to this side over here. Come on, buddy. Right over here. Follow daddy. Follow daddy. Next, we have Miss Bella Grace Teagle. Parents are Nathan and Holly. Another beautiful family. Thank you for sharing your family with us. Hi, Bella. Bella Grace. Bella Grace. <laughs> your names combine to mean beautiful one who is favored by God and gracious to others. Bella, want your Bible? That's for you. There you go. Mom, you want to help me hold that right there? Okay. Oh. And God's people said, Amen. So right there, one more picture. And then we also have Mr. Joseph Patrick Morgan Roth III. Parents are Joseph and Valerie, and joined by the Hennessy siblings. Boy, what a healthy boy, huh? <laughs> he is so pretty. Oh, Joseph Patrick, your names combine to mean a noble and respectable man to whom God will add great blessing and give strength. God's people said, Amen. Remain right here for one moment. One more picture. Oh, what beautiful families. Give God glory. In the next service, we have three more that we get to dedicate. Three more families, three more children. God is good to First Baptist. God's blessings be upon you. Take them to the nursery, quick. <laughs> Let's continue to worship now.
That's our hope. That's our goal. That's what keeps us going. Even though these bad things might be happening to us, the economy's down, works tough to find family issues, who knows? But when these things are attacking us, we can say, God, it is well, because I know your plan for me. Would you stand this way? opportunity to come here to worship and praise you Lord and we do look forward to the day that you will come again 
so we could be forever with you. Until that day comes, Lord, I just pray that for all these families that come up here, Lord, that they will grow their, their children in you, Lord. That they will learn your ways and forever want to worship and praise you. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Let's pray for the pastor, Lord, as he comes to pray today. That his words will be your words. And thank you for all you do and all you've done in our lives. Rest in the blessed name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Before I begin the message this morning, let me just give you a quick report about the situation in Haiti. Uh, the church there in Cap Distress where we minister and our missionary there, Ernie Rice, is in a difficult situation. Uh, Haiti is a mess. If you look up uh, what's going on in Haiti, you'll see it's very difficult. We complain about gas prices and diesel prices around here. A gas, gallon of gas in the Cap Distress area right now is $75 a gallon. I'm sorry, $55 gallon, dollars a gallon. Diesel is $75 a gallon. And diesel is what our school and our tech school runs off of, our sewing school, our woodworking shop, the school itself, the church, all runs off of diesel fuel. And they've got enough to last about another week, and then they'll be out, and they'll be back to primitive use there. Difficult situation. Uh, we can't get Ernie out right now. He's waiting until the doors open where he can vacate uh, that area. But it's a difficult situation. But you know, the Lord has done some incredible things there in Haiti through our church and lots of things are going on. I want to show you something. Back when we first went, this is a picture of the first time that we ever arrived there in Cap Distress. This is the church, the church that we found there. And we thought, my goodness, there's the inside of the church. Steve Miller back there taking pictures. He's our Vanna White. You'll see in the future pictures here. And so we, we realized that, you know, that, that's really not, you know, here we sit in this place and they're sitting in that place and said, hey, we need to do something about that. So we sent there a, a tent this tent right here, and it's on top of another structure that we were helping them to build, but it's the tabernacle, and we built those pews there so they'd have something to sit upon and put in sound system and all that, and that was fine, but, you know, they have lots of wind in, um, in uh, Haiti, and this thing blew down time and time again. We sent, I think, three different uh, tent shelters to go in to refit, and we realized this is just not going to be a long-term solution. And so we sent some more funds, and they began building this building here. And so they've been working on this building for a while now, and uh, this is about where it's at, right there. They got stuck on the front of it, none on the sides or in the back. The interior looks like, like this. You notice there's no, uh, no doors uh, yet. And that's the interior. They're waiting to finish it out. Now, the church has tried two times to raise the funds on their own to be able to finish out this structure so they can start worshiping in it. But due to the situation there, they've not been able to. And so what I'm proposing to you today is that we send funds and we finish this. Uh, it will approximately cost $6,000. $6,000, and we can have this place up and running. That happens to be the buildings, uh, some more classrooms that we sent funds for uh, a couple of months ago, and this is where they are getting ready to move in to those. But we want to send us. So I'm opening up an offering for two weeks, today and next week, to finish out payment on or finish out the construction of those buildings, that building there so they can begin to worship. But that's not all. That's only half of it. Now, I want us to realize we, we minister in far countries, but we also want to minister here in our own locale. These guys right here, these are good friends of mine. This is Oshman on the, my left, and then this is uh, Josue on the right. They are co-pastors at Life Church. Here's Life Church down on the south side. It's a, a wonderful little church in a difficult area in which to minister. Median income, uh, combined household income in their immediate area is $38,000. Uh, median income up here is closer to $100,000. So, uh, so difficult situation. A storm came through uh, about a year ago and demolished some of their buildings in the back. Rain damage came in, water damage. They've had all that adverted, but there's still a gaping hole back there. The buildings are unusable. Insurance is not going to pay. Yeah, 
And so they're looking at about a $60,000 project to be able to get those buildings back up and running. Now, I don't expect us to send $60,000, but I am encouraging you to give what you can. And let's help these young pastors leading their church. They called me and said, Pastor, I, I don't know how to do this, David. And I said, it's okay. The Lord will provide. And so I'm opening up that combined offering to pay for the church in Haiti. And then whatever's left over will go to support this church in helping them get up and running in their children's ministry again. All right? So as God allows you and enables you, you give a dollar, $5, $10, $100, $1,000, whatever you can give over the next two weeks. Simply title it Haiti LifeGate. Haiti LifeGate. And it'll get to the right place. I'll let you know uh, three weeks from now how we did. Okay? God's blessings upon you. I know you'll do as the Lord enables you to do. Okay. You ready? Every week we watch football around here, right? And it's inevitable that at some point in time, someone's helmet is going to fly off, right? Yeah, yeah. It is not a, a very good feeling to have 11 mean guys that are trying to take your head off and you not having a helmet on. Helmets are very important. You, you remember Saving Private Ryan? Saving Private Ryan, probably one of the most graphic uh, war movies ever filmed. I don't recommend it. It's too graphic. But it, it, it has the story of our troops storming the Omaha Beach there in Normandy. And, uh, and, and men are just being mowed down right and left. Bullets are whizzing by. And there's one particular scene where a bullet hits a helmet and ricochets off. There's a look of terror on the man's face. He's like... Am I dead? Am I dead? And then he begins to realize, I'm not dead. And he realizes that the bullet has ricocheted off. And his buddy looks to him and says, lucky. And he took his helmet off to look at the dent. And a bullet caught him in the forehead. And he was gone. Folks, helmets are important. Let me show you another picture. What do you call this? Yeah, the S word. Stupid, 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 stupid. Legal? Yes, legal in Texas. You can ride without one. But, you know, they figure by the time you're 21 where this law is no longer, you know, valid, where you have to wear a helmet, they figure by then you've grown a brain. <laughs> and no one has to tell you to wear a helmet. But, you know, helmets are important. Now, we've come to the fifth piece of armor our Lord has given us. We've looked at the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, and now the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. In Paul's day, a soldier would never go into battle without his helmet on. The, helmet, the head is the command center of the body. I mean, you've got to protect the head. You can live without a finger, live without a hand, live without an arm, a foot, or a leg, but you can't live without a head. And you need to understand something. Soldiers targeted the head, and Satan is targeting yours. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, just the first part, and take the helmet of salvation. And take the helmet of salvation. Now, and take. Now, you realize if somebody take, that means it's being offered, right? It means it's, it's available. That it's standard issue. That someone is saying, here, take this. Everyone is offered a helmet. No one is expected to live the Christian life without the helmet of salvation. Now, the question is, what is the helmet of salvation? Well, here's my definition of it. The helmet of salvation is absolute confidence in my eternal destination. Absolute confidence in my eternal destination. No one is expected to live out the Christian life without being absolutely confident of their eternal destination. It is so important that you have confidence that you are heaven-bound. God is offering you this, this temporal and this eternal assurance of your salvation. You have protection from the enemy, but the enemy doesn't want you to have it. He wants you to live in perpetual doubt and hope-so Christianity. 
But the helmet of salvation is certainty of past justification, present sanctification, and future glorification. It is absolute confidence that my sins have been forgiven, my life is being perpetually changed, and one day I will be perfected in the presence of Almighty God. Do you have that kind of absolute confidence? Do you have that secure in your mind? Are you absolutely sure that you're saved, you're being saved, and you're going to be saved? Are you willing to swing out over the fires of hell on a corn stalk and sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine? Yeah, that's the way Spurgeon used to talk about it. He was so hopelessly, helplessly saved. In fact, he was incapable of not being saved. Do you realize that? That we are now in Christ and therefore incapable of not being being saved. We are secure for time and eternity. That's what the helmet of salvation is all about. One of the greatest weapons in Satan's arsenal against new believers and about newly surrendered believers is doubt. He wants you to live in doubt. He wants you to live in uncertainty. He wants you to live in this uncertainty of, am I saved? And if I am saved, am I secure? Could I possibly lose it? And you know what that kind of perpetual doubt will do in your mind? It'll paralyze you. It'll paralyze you. It'll rob you of confidence. It'll rob you of your ability to really move forward. You see, Satan knows he can't touch your salvation. Hallelujah. He can't touch my salvation because God's got it. He started it. He's going to finish it. But what he can do is he is very competent to make me doubt my salvation. That's why God says, take the helmet of salvation. So for the next two weeks, I couldn't get it all in in one. We're going to deal with this helmet of salvation. Today, we're going to simply deal with how to know you're truly saved. And next week, how to know you're truly safe or secure. So how do you know that you're truly saved? John said it like this. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Not hope that you have eternal life. Not wish that you have eternal life. No, that you would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life. You would know this. Now, Paul over in Thessalonians says something a little bit different. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope, confidence of salvation. Now, Paul uses the word hope here, but he doesn't use it the way we use it. We use hope in, in, with a definition of wishful thinking we we hope but we're not certain but that's not biblical hope biblical hope is absolute confidence so a better understanding of this word hope in this context would be confidence we wear the helmet of the confidence of our salvation do you wear the confidence of your salvation now how do you know how how do you know well it's really very simple You do the work of God. You do the work of God. Now, in John chapter 6, Jesus is talking about eternal life. He's the bread from heaven that gives eternal life. And people begin to wonder and, and they question and listen to their question to Jesus. What must we be doing to do the works of God? In other words, what do we have to do, Jesus? What do we have to do and what do we have to keep on doing? What do we have to do to have eternal life? And what do we have to keep on doing so that we maintain eternal life? Jesus responds and he turns the plural into the singular. Listen to his words. This is the work, singular, of God. That you believe in him whom he has sent. You see, believing in the identity and accomplishments of Jesus is the singular work that determines, that catalyzes 
salvation in our life. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, rose victorious from the grave, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and has all authority in heaven and on earth, can grant to you forgiveness of your sin and the gift of eternal life. Do you believe this? You say, well, yes, I believe that. Well, you might be saved. You might be saved. Now, I'm being serious here. You you might be saved. Why am I saying might be saved well you have to ask yourself the question does your belief have more than just an intellectual assent you say you believe it mentally emotionally intellectually but do you really believe it volitionally is it a real saving belief does my life evidence more than intellectual assent you know we have a lot of professors who are not possessors. We have people who have been radically churched, but haven't been radically changed. They've been reformed, but they haven't been reborn. You know, Jesus dealt with this a lot in his ministry. He gave five parables, five stories, count them, five pointing out the fact that there would be a lot of people claiming saving faith and yet not having saving faith. You have, look at them, the parable of the wedding banquet, the parable of the tares and the wheat, the parable of the net, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the sheep and the goat, and there may be others. But they're all given to us to reveal the danger of professing without possessing. You see, the proof of your salvation is not your profession but production. Now hold that thought. There's no proof of salvation without salvation producing a continual transformation in your life. Let me show you the authentications of saving faith. The authenticating factors of saving faith. Number one, you have the test of profession and confession. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, very familiar If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, there is no salvation apart from a life-changing encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. It's where it always begins. Jesus said, no man can come to the Father but by me. He is the only way. And there are many people in our churches today who have a Christless Christianity. Now, stay with me. A crisis Christianity, they've embraced the principles. They've embraced the practices of Christianity, but they've not embraced the Christ of Christianity. There are many who, after a traumatic life experience, became religious people, but they didn't come to Jesus who is and who was and who will always be the only one who can bring salvation. You see, salvation doesn't occur when you turn over a new leaf and try harder to be good. That's not salvation. It's not you trying harder. Salvation occurs when you come before God broken and destitute, realizing that you are hopeless and you are helpless in your sin and you're going to die and spend an eternity separated from God. And the only hope that you have is someone outside of yourself, Jesus Christ. The Christ who lived and died on your behalf and rose again and will grant salvation. That's our only hope of salvation. So I ask you, what part did and does Jesus have in your salvation? In your experience, is Jesus front and center? Is it all brought down to him? When you look back into your salvation experience. Do you recall a specific time when you totally depended upon the work of Jesus for your salvation? Did you surrender over him the control of your life so that he entered in and he took up residence in you as Savior and as Lord? You see, the only authenticator of salvation, there's really only one, and that is the presence of Jesus In your life through the indwelling Holy Spirit. You see, that's the litmus test. 
Is the Spirit of God living in you? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 3, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? He said, look at yourself. Don't you see Jesus? Don't you see the activity of his spirit in your life? He said, that's the real authenticator. It's the presence of Christ in you. He says, unless... Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. You you see, what evidence can you point to that the Spirit of Jesus is alive and well in you? Can you pass the test? (laughs) I remember so well going to a sociology class in college and walking in and getting the, the syllabus there and the professor stood and he started talking to us and he made this statement to us he said I don't believe in tests or examinations I believe you're all character-based individuals and will do the assignments and learn the material without me having to put you through the arduous task of exams I just don't believe in them a spirit of elation is rising within me I'm thinking, hallelujah, a class that I can just kind of skirt through. I mean, I can study if I want. I not study if I don't want. I mean, what else does this guy teach? I'm taking everything he teaches, you know. However, he continued, the administration does not agree with me, so there will be multiple exams and numerous pop quizzes throughout the year. That's not even funny, you know. What evidence can you point to that the Spirit of Jesus lives in you? Can you you pass the examination? Let's look at the exam. Let let me give you the examination. Well, first you have the test of baptism. The test of baptism. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A person who refuses believer's baptism gives evidence that they're probably not saved. You see, because Jesus will not save the individual that he cannot command. Let me say that again. Jesus will not save the individual that he cannot command. And the first commandment that he has given to us is to demonstrate our internal relationship with him through an external act called baptism so if you've never been baptized you need to seriously examine your commitment to christ secondly the test of progressive holiness no one born of god makes a practice of sinning for god's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of god If the Holy Spirit is living within you, you will not be able to live a life of habitual sin without being made miserable by the Spirit. There is within me, and I'm assuming within you, a holy discontentment. I'm just not satisfied with the man that I am. I don't like the fact that I continue to to gravitate towards sin. I don't like the the emotions that rise up within me. And daily I have to put to death the deeds of my body and allow the Spirit of God to live its life through me. There is a stirring within me for purity, continual stirring. That, my friend, is an authentication of the Spirit living in you. Now, if you can live in habitual sin and there is no conviction of the Spirit in your life, You better seriously examine your relationship with Christ. The test of progressive love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. A true child of God will see in their life a progressive love for people. A progressive love for God, a progressive love for people. They'll never be satisfied with their love life. They'll constantly be like, I I need to be more loving. I want to be more loving. I will be more loving. They they can't live with a, a mean spirit about them. 
They care about people. They care about how people perceive them. And they're constantly trying to demonstrate love. You know, they understand the truth that all the law and all the prophets, everything written in the Bible is summed up in two things. Love God, love people. It's really not that hard, is it? Well, it is since you've got a sinful flesh, but intellectually it's not that hard. Pragmatically, it is difficult. But it's love, progressive love. Show me a mean-spirited person who lives with hatred in their heart, and I'll show you a person who does not have the spirit of Jesus living inside of them. Fifth is the test of forgiveness. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses now please understand something jesus is not telling us that forgiveness is transactional okay that to be forgiven by god we have to forgive people okay that's transactional forgiveness that's not what he's saying if that was what he's saying we might as well nullify grace okay we earn salvation by forgiving people we earn forgiveness by forgiving people that's not what he's saying What he is saying is that an unforgiving spirit reveals an unforgiven spirit. An unforgiving spirit. If you have an unforgiving spirit, a spirit that says, I don't want to forgive. I'm not going to forgive. I'll never let them live down what they've done to me. That reveals an unforgiven spirit. One of the truest indicators of our salvation is our struggle to forgive. And you notice what I said, our struggle to forgive. Forgiveness isn't easy, is it? It's hard. We have to work at it. But the Spirit of God within you is constantly going to be moving you, molding you, striving to enable you to forgive the people that have hurt you, that are hurting you, and that will hurt you. That's what a forgiven spirit does. The forgiven spirit wants to give forgiveness do you see an increasing desire and ability to forgive those who hurt you it's an authenticator of your salvation number six the test of endurance hebrews 6 11 says we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure your confidence sure in 1 John 2, 19, it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all, they all are not of us. You see, authentic believers don't stop believing. Authentic believers don't stop believing. Doesn't say we don't we don't sin at times, doesn't say we don't struggle at times, but it does say that we don't stop believing. We don't abandon the faith. The spirit of Jesus in us won't let us quit. You ever had that experience in your life? I remember it crystal clear many, many years ago. I had miserably failed the Lord in a particular area of my life. I was so frustrated. I just screamed, I quit. I can't do this, which was probably the smartest thing I ever said, because I can't live the Christian life. But, but in that moment, I said, I quit. I, I give up. I'm not going to walk with Jesus anymore. I'm giving up on the path that I'm on. I'm going back to my old way of life. It lasted less than a day. And the Spirit of God was so heavy upon me, I climbed up in an old oak tree, and I made things right with God. And I realized that day what theologians call the perseverance of the saints it's not that i preserve persevere to the end it's that god just won't let me quit the spirit of christ in me won't let me give up i struggle and i go through times of, of of defeat but i have not abandoned my faith it's evidence of my salvation number seven is the test of conformity Listen to the word. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Is your life being progressively conformed to the life of Jesus? 
You see, an authentic believer will discover as the years go by greater and greater reflections of Jesus. They'll just go, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, why am I not mad? Why did I not curse? Why did I give? What? Why am I acting this way? And you'll realize it's the Spirit of Christ living out His life in you. You no longer live. Christ is living in you. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says it will be transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Spirit is relentless in transforming us into the likeness of Jesus. Do you see that in your life? One final one. It's the test of sacrificial service. A true believer can't just sit on the sidelines. They have to serve. True faith will always authenticate itself in action. True faith always authenticates itself in action. Listen to James. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Remove the spirit from a body, you have a corpse. Remove deeds from faith, you have the same. There's no life there. If your faith in Jesus doesn't translate itself into service to others in the name of Jesus, your faith is seriously suspect. Saved people don't sit. They serve. They give. They go. That's just what we do. Because the spirit of Christ in us is active. He's constantly moving us forward. He has an agenda for our life. When his agenda is over, you're going to die. He's going to get you out of this sin-marred world as quickly as possible. But if you're still here and you're still breathing, he's wanting to do something through your life. He's always seeking to serve through you. All right, those are, those are eight authenticators of saving faith. There, there's more. We could talk about more, but, but that's enough for right now. Now, I made a statement at the beginning of this message that many of you didn't even catch. Some of you went, what did he just say? You remember that statement? The proof of your salvation is not in your profession, but in production. Now, look at that statement very closely. I didn't say in your production. Now, if I would have added the word your, I'm off. I mean, brand me a heretic, throw me out of here. This is a Baptist church. <laughs> but I didn't say your, I said in production. Here's my point. You and I are not the producers. We're not the authenticators of our salvation. We don't prove our salvation by effort. All these are indicators of the production of the Spirit of Jesus in us. He's the one who's producing all these things in us. What I'm saying is you don't hear this message and say, all right, I got to go out and prove my salvation. No, you don't need to prove your salvation. You just need to look at your life. Look at your life and see if these things are being produced in you. Is the Spirit of Christ who lives within you producing these things in you not perfecting unless you want to define perfecting as maturing but is he producing them do you see the holy spirit producing in you the continued ability to trust in jesus and does it ever get deeper your real realization that that you are totally dependent upon him you know the longer i walk with jesus the more i realize it's not up to me. I don't have to do anything. He saved me. And I rest in him. I trust in him. I rely on him. I don't trust in anything I've ever done for my salvation. I'm trusting in Jesus. That's what the Spirit does in you. You become more and more and more dependent upon Jesus. Do you see in you the desire to be baptized? The desire to progress in holiness. The desire to love more, to forgive more, to endure more, to serve more. You see, the litmus test of your salvation is not your performance. It is the Spirit's production of these characteristics and these desires in you. So I'm not telling you to go out and do something. I'm simply saying, look inside. 
Do you see evidence of the Spirit of Christ in you? Salvation begins with a moment of hopelessness. It begins with a moment of helplessness. Last summer, or maybe it was the summer before last, Lisa and I were at the beach doing our thing, and we heard the screams, Help! Help! He's drowning! Somebody, help! Now, at first we thought, (laughs) somebody's just kidding around. But then we saw the heads and the arms going up and down, up and down. A man was caught in the current. Couldn't find his footing. And he was struggling for his life. I started running. Another man next to us started running. Later found out from Oklahoma, an elder in his church. We hit the water as fast as we could. We began swimming. We got out about 10 feet from him. And I said, stop, stop. He's still trying. And so we stopped. We treaded water, and we just waited. It felt so cruel, so cruel. But we knew that until he stopped trying to save himself, we couldn't save him. So we waited until he finally, in exhaustion, just kind of began to sink. I said, now, when we swam in and we grabbed him, we began swimming him to the shore. Twenty minutes later, the lifeguard showed up. Folks, are you following me? You don't get saved until you quit quit trying to save yourself. It's only when you realize how helpless and hopeless you are that God's Spirit can move in and save you. Have you been saved? Not have you said, God, I'm sorry, I'm going to try harder. (laughs) No, you're missing it. You don't say, God, I'm sorry, I'm going to try harder. You say, God, I'm sorry. I am hopeless. I am helpless. I deserve death and hell. And I can't do anything about it. God, would you save me? I surrender. I quit trying to save myself. I'm not going to ever try to save myself. I can't save myself. Only Jesus can save me. And that's when the Holy Spirit moves in and saves your soul. That's when his life, his presence indwells you. That's when you receive the indestructible, soul-protecting, joy-producing helmet of salvation. Let's bow together. You're here today and the Spirit of God is letting you know that you've never been saved. You've come to the end of your rope. I'm going to tell you, just let go. Let go. Fall into the hands of grace. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be able to clean yourself up. You'll never be able to right your wrongs. So quit trying. Just let Jesus save you. Let him save you. Just say, Lord, save me. I'm so sorry. I quit trying to save myself. I just want you to save me. Hear my prayer. I surrender. I won't fight you anymore. I won't resist you anymore. I'll just let you do the work. I surrender. Oh, Father, in this moment, I pray people are finding that ability to believe and to surrender. Lord, help them to give up. Help them to reach that point where the Holy Spirit will then move in and do the work that only He can do. And Lord, would you give them courage in a moment when I dismiss the congregation that they would come forward and they would confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord having believed in their heart that God indeed raised him from the dead. And he is now King of the kings and Lord of the lords. And God's people said, Amen.
you're here today and you've prayed to receive Christ, you've surrendered to Him, would you make your way to the front and talk